everybody, and thank you for joining us here this afternoon. My name is Oliver Kahn. I work for the media team here. We're here to talk about breaking silos for development, sustainable development. We're here to find out whether we've got to the stage now where we can have genuine sustainable development. It's a matter of critical importance, especially in the light and the context of the, the major issues of this year's annual meeting, inequality, youth unemployment, intergenerational crisis. What role does development and sustainable development have to play in this process of addressing those deep and profound challenges. I'm not going to spend any more time talking. I'm going to hand, hand it over to uh, my esteemed colleagues on the panel. I will first just introduce them. To my immediate left, I have Justin Greening, Secretary of State for International Development of the United Kingdom. Next, I have Peter brabeck Ledmart, Chairman of the Board of Nestle in Switzerland. We have Amina Mohammed, Assistant Secretary General, Special Advisor on post-2015 development planning in the United Nations. Olaf Persson, President and Chief Executive Officer in Volvo from Sweden, and Seth Barkley, the Chief Executive Officer of the Gavi Alliance in Geneva. I would just like to invite my panelists to talk for one or two minutes on, uh, on, on the, the momentum that, we, that they, they see in the, this space, and then we'll invite questions. Minister. Thank you. We just had a really interesting session where we were talking a lot about how we can start to keep breaking down those silos between uh, what's happening in development and, and the private sector and really starting to pull people together working on essentially a common goal. And I think over the last decade or so, we made some grand steps forward to work together more hand in hand. Um, that's starting to be reflected, I think, particularly in my own department, DFID. Uh, we're now ramping up our work on economic development. And I think it's recognition that I think the development industry, if you can call it that, perhaps has had a tendency to work too often in parallel from the private sector in development. But we can see from some of the fantastic initiatives like Gavi, like Global Fund, that actually development often happens most successfully when we all work together. And therefore, what we need to do is understand how we can do that better over time and how we can understand what works and what doesn't work and perhaps come up with a stronger framework for understanding the role that the private sector can play um, in its role within the development push alongside the rest of the work that uh, goes on. So with that in mind, we'll be holding our first global partnership meeting in Mexico in April. And part of that will particularly focus on how we can improve cooperation between industry, between the private sector, and pull that more fairly and squarely into development. Um, we will look at how we can better knowledge share, how we can develop uh, better tools for working together, better models. We'll look at how we can improve financing, what sort of innovative financing in terms of development impact bonds can we look at to start to create the mechanisms by which private sector investment can more easily flow into development. So it's a really exciting agenda. And I very much hope that many of the companies that are part of this uh, meeting here in Davos can come to that meeting and really start to play their role in helping to be part of this development push that is now, I think, steadily uh, transforming so many countries in the world and, and in doing so, lifting people out of poverty. Thank you. I'd just like to now ask Peter brabeck Letmart of, of Nestle to possibly give us some insight into <coughs> whether the time is right for the private sector to, to get involved in sustainable development and, and, and what your take is on the current climate. Well, I think um, the private sector, in the case of Nestle, we have been involved in sustainability and, and, and those things uh, for many, many years. But I think what is really uh, newer here is now that uh, we are getting more and more convinced that uh, only by working together in public-private partnerships can we increase the value of every dollar that we are investing in these efforts. And I think uh, one of the first uh, things to be done uh, for any partner in a partnership is to prepare your own organization internally to be able to become a partner. That's extremely important. I think that has changed a lot over the last couple of years in, in the private sector that many companies have taken this social value creation as part of their own internal strategy. That was extremely important that has changed. 
I think in our meeting today we have clearly uh, pointed out the importance of goals. And in this uh, respect, I think uh, the development goals are extremely important because just to set up private uh, public partnerships uh, just in order to have one is, is certainly not the best thing. You have to have a goal first and then afterwards to see how you are looking for partners, how which set of skills are these partners bringing in order to be the most efficient partnership for a certain goal. So for us, the, the development goals that uh, the UN is now working out are extremely important. And uh, finally, we also felt that whatever this partnership is doing, it has to be inclusive. And that means that when you come to the execution level, this has to be on the local level and has to be inclusive all interested partners. That starts, uh, if you have an, 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 uh, an, a project on agriculture, I think you have to be able to have the small-scale farmers being included. You have to keep, somebody was saying, never forget that you always have to have the humans and the, and the human needs and values at the corner of whatever you're looking forward. Thank you. Amina Mohammed, how far are we getting towards breaking silos for development? Um, I think this is the, the big challenge for the successor development agenda that comes after the MDGs, but um, an understanding development with the new partners that we have, um, an important part of it is to, to come away from what we've um, almost finished doing the unfinished business of the MDGs, which has been very successful in galvanizing people and in particular partnerships um, to execute a number of the goals in the health sector and the education sector. Um, and I think learning from that, moving to what is a big challenge from a poverty agenda um, to a sustainable development one, just understanding how each one of us works and what are the specifics to that, the goals, the next set of goals will form a big part of that. Um, the process itself, of course, um, is probably one of the <laughs> most unattractive processes for business to join when you think about an intergovernmental process. Um, but I think that the outreach that has happened right from the onset, um, where the Secretary General's had the high-level panel, um, bringing in uh, the Prime Minister from the UK and, and President Indonesia and, and Liberia, a, a great set of people around the table to try to break that down. What does it really mean um, to engage uh, with business um, on a development agenda? Uh, government's been working with donors and works with other bilaterals. Uh, now we're bringing business into it. Um, this, I think, um, at the country level, uh, breaking down those silos is going to be one about how we address the partnerships, um, at which level, um, and uh, through what sort of sectors are we going to be working in. I think um, this makes a big, uh, if, we had, if we talk about education, for instance, it really is about the skill sets. You don't have the right skill sets, then business is going to have a tough time trying to, to, to execute that. But if you're talking about agriculture and where you walk into the agriculture uh, sector and looking for partnerships with business, it has to be the full value chain. So we can't just be going for a part of it. And I think that if we need to talk about health and agriculture, um, uh, the role of women in all of this agenda um, dimension to it. That needs to be understood as much about with government as it does the private sector and, and, how, and defining the partnerships, uh, the roles and responsibilities. Um, it's going to require a great deal of leadership. Uh, the champions will have to come from that leadership because this is a difficult challenge and I think when, when you see that happening, um, uh, then the partnerships become real and genuine. We have to send the signals out to the private sector that we are really serious um, in government um, about um, that happening. Um, then I think the new, uh, it's not just going to be about government breaking down the silos with the private sector. It's also going to be about communities, how you work with communities in a lot of what we talk about in development and um, not that uh, looking at the concerns much of civil society has um, about how this will, will come together. Um, finally, I would say that um, uh, integral to this is going to be how we address the institutions that support the new development agenda that will be hopefully enabling, uh, creating an enabling environment to, to put in place um, all of those uh, comforts that one needs to, to get a, a partnership that's not only credible uh, but sustainable over time. Thank you. Olaf Person. How does Volvo build sustainable development into the core business? Well, what we have um, done um, over the last two years is that we have really started from the top and engaged ourselves in a discussion, what is sustainability for us? How can we as a company go about the, the word sustainability and utilize that in our business in order to actually 
making sure that we are taking leadership in, in sustainable transport solutions. And after a lot of discussion, the answer was right in front of us. It's actually the UN definition from 1987, where we talk about the environment, the social, and the economical sustainability. And by applying that, we could actually start to structure our work in, in, in uh, all the different markets that we're in. We're in 192 markets and actually get a very good buy-in from the employees in order to fully understand what we mean as a company and we have it in the vision when you talk about sustainability. And a perfect example of that, which I also discussed in the, in the panel, was or is now the project we are running together with USAID and, and the Swedish development agency SIDA in Africa, where we want to together uh, educate 1,000 uh, mechanics, uh, truck mechanics. And, and this is a, a long commitment. It, it would take five to six years. And it's a perfect example where this kind of education actually brings in a competitive advantage and a business <coughs> into our strategies. Because one of the really hampering effects for us to grow in Africa is the lack of skilled and educated people. And by doing this together, we break down the silos, we create something that fits with our strategy, which is sustainability, and it also gives us a pos position to grow in markets we believe we grow very much and definitely need transport solutions. Thank you. Seth, Seth Barkley, last but not at all least, you work in a very important space, vaccines and uh, immunizations. Do you see silos in your, in, your, uh, in, your, in your practice? Are you trying to break them down? Well, let me start and go back because uh, Gavi was actually born here at the World Economic Forum in 2000. And I must say the level of trust and engagement at that time between these different sectors was very different than it is today. And we talked in this in our session about this importance of trust and, and the, the ability after time of working together and to seeing what skills each had that together can come together to solve the big problems, but not assuming any one sector alone or one group or one organization can solve them. And I think that's been the secret to the success. And Gavi's been quite successful. We've immunized 440 million children. We've prevented more than 6 million deaths. But we haven't stood still because we're trying to build a sustainable program. We're trying to improve the systems in countries that have bad systems. And, and, and in, in that, working with the private sector to bring some of the new tools to improve supply chain, to, to move data forward, and to try to change things. And an example of how the world is changing, and one of the great advantages of the Millennium Development Goals is we've seen dramatic effects on development. Um, and, and one I'd, I'd throw out in front of you is an area of women that were mentioned multiple times. Today, more women are dying of cervical cancer than of childbirth. And, you know, that's an amazing thing. That's because childbirth deaths have gone down, which is a fabulous thing. But cervical cancer deaths have gone up. We have a vaccine against cervical cancer. And the challenge is, how do we get it out there? And how do we work in communities that haven't reached adolescent girls before? So this is a priority. And so we're constantly changing, trying to work with countries, with the private sector, with NGOs to solve some of these health problems. Thank you. Well, we, we all have very tight schedules here, but we will take questions if there are any. Lady at the front. Can you just say uh, the microphone's coming, but maybe you could just give us your name. I think we'll hear you. My name is Karin Svensson, and I come from Sweden's Business Daily. That's Dagens Industri. And I have a question for Nestle and Volvo, and I wanted to ask you, what's in it for you working to be together with the development goals and together with the development agencies? And how are you going to measure the development effects that you have on society? Motivation and measurement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think definitely, as I said, the, the big benefit for us is, is that this is an activity that is integrated into our vision and into our business plan and what we would like to achieve uh, in the Africa market, for, for instance. So, so that's a, really a convergence between the targets from, from the aid agencies and our business target. And that's what I mean by sort of tearing down one of the silos. When it comes to measurement, there, there will be a very direct measurement in our case in this project. Uh, and that is, of course, that we achieve the 1,000 trained and certified mechanics. Um, and then the impact of that, we know from other places in the world that once we have a skilled and, and, and certified mechanics and a business that grows with it, you have a multiplier effect around that business in terms of families and, and services around that as well. So, for us, in this particular project, I think that measurement is what we're going to focus on. 
Mr. Brabeck Lamet. Well, in our case, um, we have developed, uh, together with Michael Port, a concept which is called creating shared value, which is based upon a strong belief that you can only create shareholder value if at the same time you're creating value for the society which, uh, which allows you to exercise your activity. That's a definition of creating shared value. So those goals, societal goals, form part of our overall strategy. They are embedded into the overall strategy. In our case, we have uh, identified three areas where we put our emphasis in it. It is nutrition, not surprising for the world leader in nutrition, health, and wellness. It is water, uh, because it is the most important raw material that we have, and uh, uh, rural development, because uh, as we are working together with more than 650,000 uh, small-scale farmers all over the world, uh, that's an area where we felt that we can really have a major impact. Measurements, we uh, um, are publishing every single year uh, our Creating Shared Value uh, report, uh, where you can see uh, the results year after year in all those three areas, uh, whether it is, for example, in uh, the efficiency of the water use. I give you just an idea. When we started, we needed 4.5 liter of water to produce one US dollar of turnover. We have brought this down to 1.5 liter of water, so an inc incredible efficiency improvement. Uh, but we share also with you uh, our efforts, how many, for example, small-scale farmer have received uh, technical assistance, how many we have helped them with microcredits and things like this. So if you look today at our uh, shareholder report, you will see that the financial reporting and the social reporting is as deep one as the other. And I think very open, very transparent in this sense, because I think measurement is extremely important and transparency is very important for that. OK, right. I'll take one more question if there is one. OK. Gentleman there. Thank you. It's a Graham Wynn from The Guardian. A question for Sitting Greening, please. You mentioned that you hope to get a, a company here at Davos to come along to the event in April. Mm. Uh, do you have any commitments yet? Which companies would you really like to see there? I think a number of uh, countries are hoping to take businesses from their own uh, corporate world. So certainly um, I've spoken with Paul Polman of Unilever, who's a huge supporter of this agenda. Um, and we will see over the coming months whether we can start to drum up more support for what I think will be a really important event. Um, I should be clear as well, the Global Partnership Meeting is not just about breaking down the silo and getting more private sector involved in development. It's about generally making sure that the many actors who now are involved in the development area, whether it's a country like the UK and, and my department, DFID, whether it's uh, governments that we work with, whether it's civil society like Oxfam or the many, many uh, groups that work in this area, uh, or whether it's the private sector, we have to make sure that we're working together effectively. And that's what the meeting in Mexico is all about. It's about starting to make sure we have better ways of working together on one agenda so that we can get further, faster, frankly. And we have some very important lessons from development in terms of what works. We can see some of the progress we've made, for example, in healthcare, where we've seen people come together and work collaboratively. Um, and actually, uh, we've, we've made amazing progress. And if you look, for example, at Global Fund, where you've seen uh, the private sector, pharmaceutical companies, uh, donors like the UK investing, uh, country-owned plans tackling, for example, malaria, um, and then working together to drive down procurement costs so that investments in some projects become worth doing that otherwise wouldn't have been because they would have been too expensive. And you really create a virtuous circle, but you need everybody inside that um, to be able to make it work. Great. Thank you very much. Well, I, I think now we all have to move on. It's time is, time is passing by, by very quickly. I'd like to thank my panel for joining us. I'd also like to thank you for joining us and also our audience, which are watching on our live webcast platform. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.